Hello, my dear senior students. Um, it's my pleasure to be a part of your microwave circuits and system course for this year. As you know from the beginning, I'm just a guest lecturer for three maybe weeks where we are going together to investigate some ideas related to rectangular web. So during these three lectures, I will be uh, with you for two hours lecture to our tutorial. Maybe we will have some other opportunities to work with an extra office hours in the form of solving sessions and so on. Also, we can still have our maybe 24 seven communication via. So now let me first start with sharing my screen to start our uh, lecture actually it will be a single document by the end of the day, including the whole uh, presentation. Okay, as I mentioned, it's just a guest lecture um, with uh, will, that will be extended for three weeks. Inshallah, we are going to cover something related to web guides. So. Before beginning, let me first start to make some sort of mapping to the next three weeks. So I will start in the first week, I will start to make some brief demonstration on the general solution for Maxwell's equation. I believe that you already have tackled this part in the beginning of your course. However, I'm just make some sort of flashbacking or scanning to this, uh, this important part to make sure that we are on the same page and we are uh, we have a common terminology. After that, again, in the first week, we will start to scan the mathematical solution for Maxwell's equation for rectangular wave. So maybe for the, the first week, it will be something like a more biased toward the mathematic lecture. By the end of the first week, we, will, we should terminate or we should reach the state that we have already determined the electrical and the magnetic component for rectangular wave guides. Then, in the second week, we will deal with some larger calculations where concepts start to appear, where we are going to investigate something like the power, the velocity, the diversity, the dispersion, sorry, and also maybe we have some time on the surface current. Finally, in the third week, we are going to investigate some interesting tools. Maybe you, you used similar tools before, the, those tools related to salt where we are going to plot the field inside the electric, inside the uh, web guide, we are going to make it via console multiphysics and as well as via a mobile tool. And also we are going to investigate some interesting plots related to the surface curve. So generally, this is the overall uh, uh, map for the next three weeks. I would say that the first week is more towards mathematics. The second is partially mathematics, partially context and the third will be totally conceptual. This is my uh, proposed plan. So let's now start the, the lecture. As I mentioned, our lecture is WebGuide. So maybe the first question to us is to answer what is WebGuide? Maybe I will start with more scratch question. Or why microwave engineering? Why you should study microwave engineering? Okay, this is very, something very interesting. For me, it's something like an obligatory step to make it whenever I start to prepare a course, to ask myself, even to ask my students, why are you studying this course? We have first to answer this question clearly in order to understand furthermore in the course. So maybe in order to answer such a question, we have to turn back to our communication class. I believe one, two years ago, when you study first the communications or the modulation techniques, and here you study what's called the baseband and the baseband signal, and in the communication modules, you have been delivered the information that in order to make a communication transmission, you have to change the frequency of the signal from a baseband signal to a baseband signal. Usually, when we are generating, for example, a voice or an image or some or a video, this is what we call a baseband signal. And then we, we, make, we need to make what's called a modulation, where we carry this baseband signal on a carrier, which is high frequency component. Now, maybe you can stop to while, for a while and ask yourself, what is the common between modulation and microwave? Actually, they are the same because now when, it, when 
what you did while you are doing modulation is simply that you transfer the frequency from a frequency around the DC value, the zero frequency, to some higher frequency. This may be in the RF region, which is the radio frequency region, or it may be higher, like in the optical region, for example. And whenever this frequency is in the higher range, then microwave engineering will start to appear. Because here you are, for example, you, you are interested to design a modulator. A modulator is a device which converts the baseband signal into a So you are, the, you are interested to design a modulator. For example, now you have to build some circuit, and this circuit will contain, will contain an RF carrier that will carry the message to a higher frequency. This, for example, this may be your circuit. And you have been already informed in year three that whenever you are, you are dealing with a higher frequency signal, this simple copper wire is no longer a wire. It becomes what's called a transmission wire. Because here you have what's called a capacitive and a, a, an inductive effect, which are somehow correlated or functioning frequency. As the frequency inc increases, these capacitive and induct inductive effects start to appear strongly, and then you are not you are not able to ignore them. However, for the same circuit, when you are dealing with a low frequency circuit or a low frequency components like what you did in your circuit course, for example, you, you don't need to include this capacitive and inductive effect because simply frequency is very low, so you can simply ignore the capacitance and the inductance. So whenever the frequency starts to increase, you have to deal with this copper wire in a very different manner. That's why you study electromagnetism tool and you study the transmission lines. Okay, this is what about circuits? or what about modulators, or what about what you can call RF electronics or RF circuits. But what about communications? As you know from your, again, from your communication classes that in order to make a signal transmission, you have two main types of uh, transmission mediums. Either what's called the unguided medium, like the air, when you are transmitting a signal in air, for example, or when you are transmitting a signal in water, or in any other medium, this is what's called an unguided medium, or you can make it still in a guided medium. Here, maybe in your other course, our other RF course, which is the antenna course, you will be more interested toward the unguided communications, where you have an antenna in order to propagate your electromagnetic waves in an unguided medium. However, in, in this course, we are interested in the other side, which is the guided mediums. These guided mediums may be a coaxial cable, maybe a twisted pair, or maybe an optical fiber. Actually, in this course, we will not deal with, you will not going to deal with optical signals because you will have another course which is 100% located toward uh, optical uh, communication in your second uh, semester, in short. In this course we are or in maybe maybe in this chapter to be more specific we are going to deal with a guided medium in the rf region where signal can transmit from a transmitter to a receiver as i mentioned for example we have a coaxial cable and we have a twisted burr maybe at some stage in this course you will reach the coaxial cable you have will study somehow the coaxial cable but in this chapter specifically we will have something like a more scratch a version to something more fundamental than the coaxial cable, which is a rectangular wave. So this is simply how communications, electronics, and microwaves are linked. By the end of the day, all are something, or are, or are a single unit in your in your uh, communication system, in your transceivers. You need an RF engineer. You need an, you, you need to make a circuit design, and by the end of the day, it's a communication system. So this is simply how life uh, looks. So now this is a guided medium, and we are now interested to study more about this guided medium. And as you know, you have already a, a very good uh, background in electromagnetism. You already have been uh, enrolled in two electromagnetic courses, so I believe you already know all this information. So you know that in order to study an electro, uh, an, uh, 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 in order to study a signal in the RF frequency, we have to deal with what's called the Maxwell's equation. I think 
that all of you know this full standard Maxwell's equation, starting with the dub or the, the uh, divergence of the D, D is electrical field uh, density, is equals to rho. Here rho is a, is a volume charge. And if the system is a pre charged state system or pre charged region, then this equation will turn to be divergence of D is equal to zero. Then we have diversion of B is equal to zero again, which is B here is the magnetic flux uh, uh, density. Here we have curl E equals to minus partial B by partial P. Of course, E is electrical field density. And curl H equals to J plus partial B by partial T. J is the current density and D is the electrical field density and H is the magnetic field density. Sometimes, maybe in your antenna course you have recognized, or maybe or even in your microwave, uh, sorry, in your electromagnetism, electromagnetism two course in your say you have recognized that sometimes people insert a letter N here in addition to this partial B by partial three. This is simply what called the analogy or the symmetric of the Maxwell's equation, as we have a current density, electrical current density uh, in the uh, in the fourth equation, we can add what's called a magnetic current density in the electric in the third equation to make some sort of symmetric. However, physically speaking, we don't have what's called a magnetic current. So this is simply the form of Maxwell's equation you have already dealt with maybe several times, and I think you already dealt with in the beginning of this course and as well as in the antenna course. What we are going now to do is we are going just to shift the format of this of, of this equations. But before shifting the, the format, we have to agree on some certain important facts. That's why I call this uh, pre-stage in the lecture as some sort of uh, uh, terminology fixation. We are fixing the terminology to agree that both of us are speaking the same language. So first of all, I would like to uh, highlight some important points. The first point is that, what are the unknowns in this equation? If you directly go through these equations, you know that D and E are linked somehow, D are equal to X epsilon and E, and P equals mu, mu times H. So actually the main two unknowns in these equations are E and H. So simply we are solving Maxwell's equation to find E and H. Then we have to turn another question. What is E and H? I mean, what are the independent parameters for E and H? So in order to answer this question, let me please transfer to my simple whiteboard and in order to start writing some equations. Okay, let me for a while stop, uh, stop sharing screen and let's go together with this solution. Okay, so we agree that whenever we are dealing with Maxwell's equation, our target is to solve this Maxwell's equation in order to determine E and H, where E represents the electrical field in Tennessee and H represents the magnetic field and density. But the question is, what are the independent parameters for E and H? E and H, or the electrical field and density and the magnetic field and density are what's called a spatial temporal function. What I mean by spatial temporal function is simply that these functions are function in space in X, Y, Z, and T, same for that H its function in X, Y, Z, and C. So simply, this function, which are electrical field and magnetic field, both are functional in space, and also they are functional in time. So here we are talking about what's called a time-dependent function. In order to make life easy, we can make this equations a bit simpler by separating the time component from this electrical field and magnetic field, of course, and transferring it to what's called a time-independent electrical field and a time-independent magnetic field. What, what we can do very simply is as follows. We can say that this E function is equals to E function in X, Y, and Z. With another E function only for, its, for this E 
dash and this equals this double dash of whatever you want into that. So now we have a function which is a time the independent function, which is the e dash function or the first function, call it to whatever you want. And we have another function which is contains only the time dependent component. And as you know from your communication classes, this time dependent component is usually a sinusoidal component, which is by the way the carrier. So you can say that this time dependent component is simply e power j omega z, which is the normal sinusoidal component we have we already know. So from now on forever, whenever I'm dealing with electrical field or a magnetic field, I will only deal with this time independent component. Knowing that that overall E is just the time independent component multiplied by the time dependent component, which is constantly E power J omega T. So now we will reduce this E from E function in X, Y, Z, and T into an E function in X, Y, and Z. And we know that this is also multiplied by this e power j omega t. Very simple. Okay, that's perfect. Then, what is the effect of this separation on Maxwell's equation? Okay, let's see. So, you know that one of the Maxwell's equations are as follows. We know that one of the Maxwell's equations is, for example, per E equals minus partial P by partial P. As you can see here, we are differentiating that magnetic field density P with respect to time. As I just said, P is simply equals to mu times H. And as we also mentioned that H includes a time independent component, which is X, Y, Z, multiplied by an exponential, which is E power J omega T. So knowing that the mu is not a function in time, so simply, when you are differentiating the electric, sorry, the magnetic field with respect to time, you are just differentiating this element because mu is not a function of time. This H is a time independent component. So simply, you are just differentiating the exponential component. And as you know, the, the, the differentiation of this exponential component is just that coefficient, which is J omega. So what we can write is as follows. Partial P by partial T equals J omega times mu times H X Y Z times E power J omega T. Very simple. So now this is J omega mu, and simply this is the original H as it is. It's H as an independent function, time independent function, multiplied the time dependent component. So simply this is equal to J omega mu H. So returning back to our Maxwell equation, which says that per E equals negative partial P by partial T, we can write it that curve E equals negative J omega mu times H. In a very simple manner. This form is called what's called the differential form for a Maxwell's equation. And this is called what's called the phase of form for a maximum equation. So both are representing actually the same equation in a two different mathematical perspectives. Similarly, we can do 
the same for the for the other Maxwell's equation. So, by the way, all these uh, handwritten slides will be uh, scanned and will be uploaded to you over the e-learning and by email, so you don't need to uh, worry about writing back what I'm writing here in these slides. So, now, the other Maxwell's equation is curl uh, h equals partial v by partial t. Here I'm ignoring the fact of the current. We don't have a current. It's a, a current-free region, so j is simply h to zero. d equals epsilon times h. And again, this is equal to e epsilon e of x, y, and z times e power j omega t. So simply, again, when you are differentiating this equation with respect to, to time, again, epsilon is a not fun, is a not a time independent function, and e x y z is a time independent function. Again, the old time dependent component is e for j omega t. So simply, this differentiation will turn to be j omega epsilon multiplied by the same original e. Accordingly, you can write this curl h equals j omega epsilon times electrical p. Okay, now if you turn back to my first talk about the unknowns in the Maxwell's equation, I told you that the main unknowns we are now seeking to make a solve with respect to them are the ENH. So by simply combining the two equations we reach, this is the first equation. Curl E equal minus G omega mu H. And this is the second equation. Curl H equal J omega epsilon E. As you can see, these are two equations in two variables, E and H. So simply, whenever you are doing a Maxwell's equation problem, you are going to solve these, key, these two equations with respect to, to the two unknowns, E and H. However, before proceeding, we have to make another important perspective to the E and H. If you remember, we already mentioned that this E and H are a spatial and a time-dependent components. So they are function in X, Y, Z, and T. And we already separate this time-dependent component outside with E power J omega T, and we say that we have E, X, E function in X, Y, and Z, if you remember. Okay, so it's a, it's a function in X, Y, and Z. But please don't forget that this E is a vector component. So E have, have some, has somehow a direction. And generally, this E should have a three components. So this E is equals to EX in X cap plus EY in a Y cap and EZ in a Z cap. This is a component in that x direction, y direction, z direction, x cap, y cap, z cap are simply the unit vectors in the x, y, and z direction. So they are function in x, y, and z, and they have a component in the x and y and z. Because usually students are somehow confused because between the functionality and the directions. Here is the function, here is the directions. So by writing, for example, of course, what I'm saying for E is typically reflected to H. So H have three components in three directions. I don't need to repeat. You can automatically imagine that this is a full symmetry. So, for example, when I write the equation, curl E equals J omega, or minus, I'm sorry, minus J omega mu times H, Actually, mathematically, this equation is three equations, not one. Because simply you have H com X component equation, Y component equation, and Z component equation. So we can write this equation three times for three different directions or three different unit vectors. This is actually one of the very important points you have 
usually to understand and to recognize whenever you are dealing with Maxwell's equation. Again, please remember that this is only a revision in order to make sure that you are understanding the concepts that we are going to use in solving the, our problem, which is our rectangular web guy. So now let's proceed in this manner. Great, so now we need also to make more and more further investigation to these components, e, x, and, uh, x, y, and y. And in order to make such an investigation, we, can, we have to make some sort of assumption. This, is, this assumption actually is related to what's called the direction of propagation. The direction of propagation here, we are assuming that the direction of propagation is the cost of an axis. So, following what you already know from your electromagnetism background, you know that whenever we have an electromagnetic wave propagating in, a, for example, that direction, then the z dependent component will appear in the form of e power minus j theta z. So this is a, the component associated with the direction of propagation. You did this exercise, I believe, in your electromagnetism 2 course. So for, this is for what's called an ideal lossless medium, where you have only a propagation coefficient called theta. However, whenever this medium is a losing medium, another alpha appears in addition to the beta. So you have what's called gamma equals to alpha minus j beta, where alpha represents attenuation. And if you would like to make the same component, but propagating in the negative z direction, for example, then it will turn to be e power j beta z. No negative z beta z, but simply you will replace this z by negative z and then it's e power j beta z. So based on this information, which we already know, we can say that this e function in x, y, and z is simply E function in x, y multiplied by E power minus J, etc. So in a very simple manner, as you can see here, we separate again the parameters, the independent parameter, X and Y are unknown, and E power minus J beta Z as our uh, exponential or is our uh, Z dependent component. So again, we are now interested to go to Maxwell's equation in order to solve. What we are going to do here is without we, we are going to do what's called a general solution. Here, what we mean by general, general solution is we are not going to, to, to solve Maxwell's equation with respect to a specific dimensions or a specific structure, or we are not going to solve Maxwell's equation with respect to a static or a known boundary condition. We are going to make a general solution. This general solution then can be reflected to any structure as we will going to do uh, in our rectangular. So what simply is we first need to remember the two equations. We know that per E equals minus J omega mu times H. And curve H equals J omega epsilon times E. We know these two equations. These are the two equations we are going to solve together in order to make our solution. In order to go deeply mathematically in these two equations, we have to understand how can we perform the E or the H. For example, I will make this detailed mathematical solution for the first one. So I will consider this one and I will try to make some sort of a mathematical description, step-by-step -step mathematical description for this equation. Okay, so our equation is 
Pull E equal J or minus J omega mu times H. Again, we have to remember that this E inside the curve has EX in the X cap plus EY in a Y cap plus EZ in a Z cap. So, in order to perform the curl, you, you, I believe you remember already this curl matrix from your uh, EM2 course, maybe, or mathematics that we have here X cap, Y cap, Z cap, and then we have partial proportional X, partial proportional Y, partial proportional Z, and finally we have EX, EY, and EZ. Now we are going to use this matrix in order to write the three equations uh, 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 um, uh, um, um, investigated or uh, driven from this general equation. As I mentioned earlier, that this main equation has under its umbrella three hidden equations in the x direction, y direction, z direction. So simply, if we start, for example, with the x component, so we are going to hide the first column, the first row, and we make, to make this uh, cross multiplication. So we have partial EZ by partial Y. Minus partial EY by partial Z. Equals negative j omega mu hx. So this is the first equation driven from this matrix. Again, what I did is simply I had the first one first column and exist multiplication and I do it in this manner. Now, can we proceed more with this equation? That's it. The first is that we are differentiating the z component with respect to y. But we, have, we still have no idea about how this component is a function in y. So I have nothing to say here. So we'll write partial e z by partial y. Then we are going to differentiate the second component, the, the y component with respect to z. Here, we can stop a bit and remember that for every electrical field component, the z-dependent co z component or the z-dependent function is in the form of e power minus j beta z. So simply, when you are going to differentiate this component, when you are going to differentiate partial e by partial z, whatever this e component direction is, you will get a function minus j beta times e, which is simply the coefficient of this exponential. So what we can make now is that we can make use of this, as, it's not assumptions, with this information that the that dependent component is in the form of e power minus j beta z. Accordingly, we can say here, that this partial EY by partial Z, I'm sorry, my handwriting is uh, very bad. Uh, so partial EZ by partial Y will end with minus J beta EY. Then this equation will be plus J beta EY equals again minus J omega mu times. So, simply speaking here, we can have three equations out of this central equation. One in the x direction, one in the y direction, and one in the z direction. Then you can have three equations. Again, using the other equation, curl h equal g omega epsilon e, using the same matrix form now for the curl, but for the h component, you can have another three equations for that, uh, or as an 
sub equations from this central equation. So you can now here get three equations from this equation, another three equations from this equation, then it will end up with six main equations. So let's see. Okay, now this is my presentation again, my dear students. And let's now turn to this. As you can see here, we have, this is the differential format of Maxwell's equation, and then this is the phasor format. And after subdividing this equation into three different component variable equation, we get this general six equation. For example, this is the first equation we drive together, which is partial e by partial y plus j beta e y equals to minus j mu h x. This is the equation we do it step by step. And similarly, you can extract the other six equations. These are the main six equations governing the Maxwell's equation as a general solution for Maxwell's equation. Again, as you can see in this example, we did not implement this Maxwell's equation on a specific structure or using a certain boundary condition. It's just a very generic solution. Now, what we are going to do is to transfer from a general case into some specific cases. First of all, we can make some sort of uh, readjustment, let me say, to this equation. So please, again, let me return back to my simple white paper. Okay, as we agree together that E had a component in the x direction, x cap, a component in the y direction, y cap, and a component in z direction, z cap. And if you remember, we already made an assumption saying that the direction of propagation is that, that direction. Accordingly, we can now divide our components into two sets of components. The first set of components is the component in the, the same direction of propagation, which is this component, what we can going to say that this is that long, the longitudinal component. So the longitudinal components are the component, not components, component are the, comp or is the component in the direction of propagation. Again, you can do the same exercise for action. So now H has three components. Again, this is the longitudinal component. And what about the two other components? The two other components, we will call them the transverse components. So the X and Y are the transverse components, and the Z is the longitudinal component, which is a component of direction of propagation. So this is a very important definition. We have to agree with, we have to, we will use it across our module or specifically across our chapter. So now let me return back to my slides once more again. Okay, these are the main six equations we have already reached while we are solving the two main Maxwell's equations, if you remember. Now, what we are going to do is a very simple mathematical step. Maybe I'm not so interested uh, to do it step by step because this is just a lot of uh, mathematical steps and actually it's not so important to make it by your hand, is that we are going to write the transverse component in terms of the uh, longitudinal component. I mean, we are going to write EX, EY, HX, and HY in terms of EZ and HZ. How we can make this? Actually, it's very simple. There are just two equation substitution. How? For example, as you can see, this equation, for example, this equation includes EZ, EY, and HX. Now, what if you couple this equation with this equation? 
These equations include hx, hz, and ey. For example, very simply, you can say here that ey equals 1 over j omega epsilon times all this stuff. And then you can replace ey in the first equation with this equation. Now, hx will be function in hz and ez. So it's a very simple two coupled equation substitution in order to get the three the four components ex, ey, hx, and h1. Okay? Then after that, you will get these four sets of equations. Ex, sorry, hx in terms of ez and hz, hy in terms of ez and hz, ex in terms of ez and hz, and ey in terms of ez and hz. So these are the four main equations representing the uh, four transverse components in terms of the two longitudinal components. But mathematically speaking, in order to solve these four equations, we need to have two additional more equations. Because simply, these are four equations. And we have six unknowns, three E components unknowns, and the three Z comp H components unknowns. So we have we have to have six equations in order to solve six unknowns. However, we will not going to do it in this manner. What we are going to do is what we are going to do is that we are going to eliminate the unknown. What I mean by eliminating the unknown is just, just simply assuming that some of them are not are equal to zero. Herein, we are going to make three different important classifications based on the, the type of elimination we are going to do. The first super elimination is simply that we are going to say that, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I actually I forgot to mention a very important point. I forgot to mention a very important one. So I'm sorry for that. Before proceeding, is that now in this new four equation, if you if you can see here, this is equation is just function in omega, mu, and epsilon. That's all. However, in this four new equation, we have a new parameter which is kc, or what's called the cutoff wave number. This new cutoff wave number is simply equals to k square minus b square. I believe all of you already know k as a wave number. If you remember, let me return back to my slide and do my wild, uh, whiteboard. k, which is the wave number, is simply equals to omega root mu epsilon and equals to 2 pi over lambda. If you remember, this is a standard wave number. We already uh, uh, deal with, if you remember, in the wave equation in electromagnetism uh, 2. So this is the K. And beta, as we mentioned already, this is the propagation coefficient of, of, of the wave. So simply, again to the slides. So simply, KC, or the cutoff wave length, maybe later on we will know why we call it the cutoff wave length, because this is somehow important in our slides. Or in our chapter. So simply this kc square is k square minus beta square. Again, k is the wave number and beta is a propagation curve. Let me now return back to my sequence where, where, I, where I was talking about that unknown elimination. We have four unknowns. And oh I'm sorry, we have six unknowns. And but we have only four equations. So what we are going to do is that we are going to eliminate two unknowns out of them. What are these two unknowns? Simply, we are going to eliminate the longitudinal unknowns. We are going to say that let's assume e is on the net that equals to zero. Here, you have to think a while and say, oh, this is actually an, an unlogical assumption because when ez and hz are equals to zero, this means that simply all these components are equal to zero because 
Here, H, X, H, Y, E, X, and E, Y are simply dependent on E, Z, and H, Z. So when you are got, when, when you are going to set E, Z, and H, Z equal to zero, that means that all these four components are equal to zero. That's actually true from a mathematical point of view. Except, except if this KC is also equal to zero. In this only case, you will have a zero over zero component, which is undetermined component. And then you have to search for another way to determine the E and H. They have a values, E, X, E, Y, H, X, and X, Y have a values, but they will not be reached from these four equations because these equations will tend to zero over zero values. So this approach will be only valid if and only if we have kc is equal to zero, which simply means that k square equals to b square. This is the only equation. And this is what we call the TEM or the transverse electromagnetic wave. We call it the transverse electromagnetic wave because in this solution, all the components are transverse. We assume that the longitudinal components are equal to zero. And all we have is simply a transverse component. That's all. So we call it a transverse electromagnetic wave. OK, what is the other side? What is the other assumption? This is the first. I said that we have three assumptions or three classifications. So, so this is the first assumption. What about the others? The other assumption actually is very easy. Let's eliminate only one of these two equations. So what we are going to say is that, for example, let's eliminate the EZ. I mean, we only have a transverse electric, but the magnetic is a complete HX, XY, H0. So we have TE modes only. Here, if you remember, we have TEM. I mean, the transverse is applied for electrical and magnetic. Both are transverse only. We don't have the material. Now, what if we have a transverse electrical only? So what we are going to do simply is that we put EZ is equal to zero. Electrical fields are only transverse. So these four equations tends to be in this format. Simply by putting Ez is equal to zero, as you can see here. So for example, the first equation will be minus uh, J beta of a k, k c squared partial h z by partial x. Uh, the second will be minus J beta k c squared partial h z by partial y and so on. So just very simple by eliminating uh, Ez or by putting Ez equal to zero. But, you have to be very careful while dealing with this solution because this solution will only be valid if and only if kc square is not equal to zero. Because if kc square or kc is equal to zero, that means that these four components will tend to infinity. So the solution will only be valid if kc square is greater than zero. This is very important, by the way. This is the first, the second assumption. So the first assumption was to, to eliminate both EZ and EY. Sorry, EZ and HZ. And we have a transverse electromagnetic. The second one is just to eliminate one of them. So we have EZ equals to zero, and then we call it transverse electric. The second or the third solution is simply to eliminate the other side, which is the magnetic component. So we call it transverse magnetic. And herein we have Kc square, again, the condition that Kc square shouldn't be equal to zero. Otherwise, these four components will tend to infinity. So simply, these are the four, oh, not just four, I'm sorry, these are the three possible solutions. However, you should here still ask the question. When we are dealing for a TM, for example, this problem is still exists. Why? Because we still have five unknowns with four equations. You still have HX, HY, uh, EX, EY, and HZ. So we still have five unknowns and four equations. So we still have a problem. In order to solve the problem here, 
we are going to with what we already driven in our EM2 course, which is the Helmholtz wave equation. If you remember the Helmholtz wave equation, let me return for a while to my uh, uh, whiteboard, uh, white, whiteboard, and let me remind you with you with the Helmholtz wave equation, saying that nabla square over e plus k square e square uh, e, e, e equals to zero. This is the Helmholtz wave equation, which is typically can be applied for h in this manner. Again, this equation can be applied or can be subdivided into three components, Ex, Ey, Ez, and Hx, Hy, Ez, Hz. So by using this Helmholtz wave equation, you can now introduce the fifth important equation, which is the Helmholtz wave equation for the Te mood. But let's now investigate to some extent this Helmholtz wave equation. Okay, so you know this Nabla square, or what we what we call mathematically is the Laplacian operator. We know that this Laplacian operator is simply as follows: partial two by partial x square plus partial two by partial y square plus partial two by partial z squared. So by writing the Laplacian uh, or the wave equation, we can say partial two by partial um, x square plus partial two by partial y square plus partial two by partial z square plus k square, all operated on, for example, edge z, is equal to zero. This is simply the wave equation. What I did simply is that I take here h as a common factor, so I have nabla square plus k square, and then I br uh, break the nabla square the, using this redirect. Again, please remember. Remember what? Remember the z dependent component. Let me return back to it. So, to, 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 I think we have it somewhere here. Okay, so maybe I lose somehow the order. Yeah, I, I got it. So this slide. Okay, so here we have e power minus j beta z. So we, whenever we have a differentiation with respect to z, it's simply negative j beta. If, if it's a second derivative, it will be negative j beta or square, which is negative beta square. So simply speaking, this partial two by partial z square is simply negative beta square. So here you have k square minus beta square, which is simply the cutoff wave number, kc square. Accordingly, you can say that this is a new form of uh, max of uh, the wave equation. The new form of wa the wave equation is simply partial two by partial x square plus partial two by partial r square plus kc square, which is, we have concluded from k square minus beta square, applied on edge that is equal to zero. Now, this is a second order differential equation, but two di dimensional second order differential equation. It's a two dimensional because it's equation in x and y, and second order because this is a second derivative. So it's a two dimensional second order differential equation in only one unknown, which is hz. So simply, if you solve this differential equation and get hz, you can now substitute with this, with this hz in these four equations, and then you can get the full solution for the five components you are investigating. So first solving this equation, and then substituting here, you will get the solution. And this is typically what we are going to do in our next part in this lecture. Okay, finally, let's introduce something you already know, which is the impedance of the signal or the impedance of the wave, which is simply the Ex over Hy or minus Ey over Hx, which is here, as you can see, if we divide the component Ex 
over the component HY, you will find that this is equal to omega mu over beta. What is only interesting in this uh, Z component actually is that this Z component is function in frequency. You can write it also in the term of eta, if you remember eta, which is root mu over epsilon. Actually, we will return back to this part later on in uh, our uh, lecture. Finally, as we did for the TE mode, we can typically do the same for the TM mode, but with respect to EZ. Simply speaking, what we are going to do is we are going to substitute, we have four equations in, four, in five unknowns, so we are going to add a fifth equation, again, the wave equation, in terms of EZ, and then we can get EZ and substitute it here back to get the other four components. And again, of course, we have the same definition for the impedance, which is EX over HY, which is now beta, eta over K, or beta over omega X. So this is the procedure we are going to use in order to solve our equation, our structure. In the next part, inshallah, we are going to go together in a specific structure, which is a rectangular waveguide. And we are going to use what we have already learned in part number one in order to study the electrical and the magnetic fields in a rectangular waveguide. Thank you very much, my dear students, and waiting for you in the next lecture or in the next part, inshallah. Thank you very much.